Chapter Ten of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. Lady Q. Twink and Tom were utterly bewildered at their friend's disappearance. They didn't know what to do next. Twiffle turned to King Ticket and Queen Curtain on the stage and demanded, Where is the Shaggy Man? King Ticket looked up innocently. Why, has he gone somewhere? Certainly he has gone somewhere, said Twiffle, who was becoming angry. And you had better tell us where. Don't forget that the Shaggy Man is an important personage of the Land of Oz. If anything happens to him, you will be sorry. Pooh, sniffed King Ticket. We all know about the Land of Oz and its silly girl ruler, Ozma. But your famous shaggy man had not even heard of the Valley of Romance. What can anyone in Oz do? They don't even know of our existence. I wouldn't be too sure of that, declared Twiffle, with more courage than he felt. Anyway, continued King Ticket musingly, the Land of Oz is vastly overrated. Why, as far as I know, there isn't a single theater in all the country. And so, began Queen Curtain quietly, why don't you children just make yourselves comfortable until dinner time? Then you may join us for the meal, and afterwards you shall be our guests in the royal box to witness the performance of our new play. Twiffle was aroused now. He climbed right up on the arm of King Ticket's chair. We don't want your dinner. We don't want to see your play. All we want is Shaggy Man, and then we shall continue our journey. Tut tut, admonished King Ticket. What a violent disposition the little puppet has. I'm afraid, said Queen Curtain, that you really have no choice. You must stay here until we are ready for you to depart. After all, you came of your own accord, you know. Twiffle was silent. He was at a loss to know what to say or do. Twink and Tom felt suddenly alone and a little bit frightened. Now that the shaggy man was gone, even in the brief time they had known him, they had grown very fond of him and had come to rely upon him. Seeing this, Twiffle returned to stand by the children and said, Never you mind. We'll find the shaggy man all right. Perhaps it would be wise to remain here tonight, as these people wish us to do. That will give us a chance to find out what they have done with Shaggy. This was said in a whisper to which Tom answered, Well, I could enjoy a good meal. We haven't had anything to eat but fruit since yesterday. Actually, Tom was as worried about Shaggy as Twink, but, being a boy, he didn't want to let the girl know. Twink was indignant. I'm surprised at you, Tom. The idea of talking about food when we just lost our best friend. But I suppose Twiffle is right. Good, said King Ticket. Then that is settled and you will be with us for dinner and the theater. Gosh, exclaimed Tom, do you suppose he heard everything we said? I don't have any doubt of it, replied Twiffle calmly. Therefore, we might as well converse in our ordinary voices. You were indeed fortunate to have arrived just in time for the opening night of our new play, said Queen Curtain pleasantly. I am sure you will enjoy it immensely. Tell me, have you children seen many plays? Oh, yes, replied Tom. We have seen lots of our school plays, and last Christmas Twink and I had important parts in the Christmas pageant. Well, then, you will certainly enjoy yourselves tonight, said the Queen, smiling happily at the children. We will work only about an hour more. Then everything will be in readiness. That will give us plenty of time to tidy up dress in our finest, and enjoy the dinner and the play to the utmost. The 
hour passed swiftly the children apparently were engrossed in the work going on on the stage but actually their thoughts were busy puzzling over the mystery of what happened to the shaggy man lady q will show you to your rooms children announced queen curtain rising from the throne the lords and ladies were putting away their tools and sewing a tall thin worried-looking woman sewing basket on her arm stepped down a short flight of stairs from the stage and smiled rather absent-mindedly at twink and tom will you come with me i think she said hesitantly twink and tom looked at twiffle who nodded and all three followed the tall lady who was proceeding uncertainly up the aisle outside the theatre lady q led twiffle and the children up a broad staircase leading to the second floor of the castle here there was a long corridor with smaller corridors leading off of it each with many doors opening into various suites and rooms lady q had advanced only a short distance down the main corridor when she stopped uncertainly before a door and turned to her charges this is a door she said but do you think it is the right one i'm sure we wouldn't know madame replied twiffle after all you live in this castle and should know all about it lady q sighed of course of course i forgot for the moment that you are the strangers well we shall have to do our best to find the right door haven't you been in any of these rooms asked tom curiously in them asked lady q vaguely oh i must have since i live here you know once inside the rooms i am sure i would be able to find my way with no trouble but outside them is most confusing how is one to know what is inside when one is outside lady q looked at them beseechingly and wandered down the corridor to another door exactly like the one she had just left she stared at this one for several minutes then boldly opened it a crack and peered in oh goodness i beg your pardon she said to someone in the room hastily closing the door well she said that's one that isn't the one the first knight of the realm is in there pressing his breeches for tonight's performance the first knight of the realm presses his own clothes asked twink he does he does asserted lady q wagging her head i did it for him once but somehow the creases ran zigzag and he looked like he was corrugated it is my opinion though lady q added in a confidential whisper that he wears a poor quality garment lady q turned and started down one of the smaller corridors twink tom and twiffle followed her at which lady q stopped and looked at them with a puzzled expression did you wish to see me she asked you were taking us to our rooms reminded twiffle i was exclaimed lady q greatly surprised well then you just show me where your rooms are and i will be glad to take you to them but you were supposed to show us to our rooms said tom oh i was oh dear this is confusing said lady q have you no idea where our rooms are madame asked twiffle i wouldn't say that replied lady q i did have a very good idea but it seems i mislaid it somewhere there are so very many rooms you know and any one of them might be yours if only there weren't so many people in the castle that's what we must be careful about you know you will want your very own rooms won't you i don't think you would want to share rooms with someone else would you maybe all the time they were wandering from corridor to corridor while lady q became more and more unsure of her bearings at last she stopped and said hopelessly you'll have to pardon me my friends but i am afraid i am lost i haven't the faintest idea where we are what shall we do asked twink i have it said lady q i will pin my handkerchief to this door 
and she indicated a door opposite them, so that we can't get more lost. Whenever we pass this door with the handkerchief on it, we will know exactly where we are. And where will that be? asked Twiffle. Why, where the handkerchief is, of course, replied Lady Q. With that, Lady Q reached in her pocket and pulled out a large linen napkin that bore traces of food on it. Oh, dear, she exclaimed. I seem to have picked this up at luncheon. How thoughtless of me. She advanced to the door and, removing a large safety pin from the front of her dress, carefully pinned the napkin to the door. "'Whose rooms are these?' asked Twiffle. "'I haven't the faintest idea,' replied Lady Q. "'Why not open the door and find out?' pursued Twiffle. "'Why not?' echoed Lady Q as she turned the knob and pushed open the door. They all stepped inside. There was no sign of any occupants of the room. The closets were all empty, and there were no personal articles about. The suite consisted of a large, beautifully furnished living room, with doors leading to two comfortable bedrooms with baths. "'Why can't we use these rooms?' asked Twiffle. "'What a wonderful idea!' exclaimed Lady Q. "'Then we won't have to hunt any longer for your rooms.' because these will be your rooms. But are you sure it's all right? It sounds much too simple. And with a worried look, the poor lady started to take down the napkin from the door. No, no, said Twiffle. Leave the napkin there. Then you'll be able to find us again. Remember now, just look for the napkin on the door, and you'll know which is our room. Lady Q nodded and extracted a large old-fashioned watch from the depths of her sewing basket. She squinted at it and said, You have just one half hour to prepare for dinner. I will call for you and take you to the, the, oh yes, the dining room. That, she confided, is where they are serving dinner tonight. With that, the befuddled Lady Q closed the door, only to find that she was still in the room so she opened it stepped outside and then carefully closed it again twink tom and twiffle in spite of their troubles burst out laughing if anything went right with the play tonight they were sure it wouldn't be due to lady q's efforts while twiffle waited patiently the children bathed scrubbed their faces and hands and reappeared much refreshed and quite ready for the dinner that had been promised them. Twink was fascinated with the long rows of books on one side of the luxuriously furnished room, but she hardly had time to more than glance at a few pictures, when there came a gentle rapping on their door. Twiffle opened it. There stood Lady Q. Her dress was on backwards, and she had forgotten to do her hair solemnly she counted twink tom and twiffle one two three is that right she asked them anxiously were there just three of you so often when i count i have something left over this time it seems to come out even that's very odd three would be odd muttered twiffle fortunately lady q didn't hear him or she might have become even more confused. She was already on her way through the corridors, so the children and the clown followed her. After several false starts, and wandering through a number of corridors, they finally found their way to the great staircase. End of chapter 10「11」「『of Shaggy Man in Oz」「This is a LibriVox recording」「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain」「For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org」「Shaggy Man in Oz」by Jack Snow」Chapter 11 What Happened to Shaggy? The grand dining room of the castle was brilliantly lighted by three huge crystal chandeliers. Each of the chandeliers flamed with more than a score of tapering lights, 
which were reflected shimmeringly in the alabaster ceiling and walls. As soon as Twink, Tom and Twiffle entered the dining room, they were espied by the Queen Curtain, who motioned them to sit themselves at her right. The Queen Curtain and King Ticket occupied the head of the table. The lords and ladies of the castle were filing into the dining room, chattering spiritedly and all handsomely gowned and garbed. In a few minutes they were all seated. There were a few glances, curious ones, at the three strangers at the table. But for the most part, the lords and ladies of the Valley of Romance were far too excited over the play they were to witness that evening to give more than a passing glance to the children and the little clown. The meal passed through many delicious and elaborate courses with no incidents. Queen Curtin played the charming host occasionally tossing pleasant remarks to the children and Twiffle. Poor Lady Q put salt in her tea instead of sugar, but she drank the entire cup without seeming to notice her mistake. Perhaps she really likes it that way, Twink whispered to Tom. At the end of the meal, King Ticket rose and addressed the assemblage solemnly. The moment has come for which we have prepared these many days. We will now pass into the theatre for the first performance of the new play. No one spoke. This apparently was an important moment. The only sound in the vast dining room was the rustling of ladies' skirts and the patter of footsteps on the alabaster floor. Queen Curtain took Twink by the hand and Tom and Twiffle followed into the theatre. It was brilliantly lighted as the lords and ladies settled into their seats. A few of them hurried backstage. They were the ones who worked the scenery and otherwise aided in the presentation of the play. Twink, Tom and Twiffle found themselves seated in the royal box with King Ticket and Queen Curtain. The house lights dimmed, the curtains went up and with no preliminaries the play was underway. The two actors walked woodenly on the stage. They were what dressed in what Tink and Tom could tell was supposed to be armour, but was obviously creating utensils stuck together, about to fall off. From the words they were saying, the two knights seemed to be getting very angry at each other. Hmm. Hmm. But they looked at the audience instead of looking at each other and spoke their lines in a dazed, unexcited way, as if they were talking in the sleek. Impossible as it seemed from their lack of action, it became apparent that they were so enraged that they had decided to fight out in a tournament over the quarrel over a lady. Oh yes, there she was at the side of the stage, paying no attention at all to the knights. The tournament scene came next. The knights in the pots and pans were mounted on extraordinary horses. Each was made up of two men covered with tufted candle wick bedspreads. They too moved about the stage in a slow and sleepy way. The lady who had inspired the fight looked on from a box seat at the edge of the stage, waving a handkerchief. But it had slipped her mind, apparently, that it was a tournament she was watching, and she looked straight at the audience and listlessly waved her handkerchief, as if trying to get the attention of anyone who might care to wave back at her. When the knights supposedly rushed their horses at each other and aimed their spears, the steeds ambled closely and slowly in opposite directions so far apart that they seemed not to be aware of each other at all. When they finally did get together, the horse of the knight, who was to be the winner, slipped and fell down, and the bedspread slipped to the floor. The horse on the knight who was to be victorious had to be reassembled before he could triumph over his victim, who had been watching him pick himself up the floor. Twink and Tom had to clap their hands over their mouths to keep from bursting out with laughter. <laughs> They did this because it was apparent that the king, Ticket, and the queen turtle, and the lords and ladies took the play quite seriously. Indeed, they were widely enthusiastic. Throughout the entire play, the scenery kept topping over. Lord Props provided the wrong sound effects and stayed furniture at every opportunity. Lady Q became so interested in a book of poetry that she had read from this instead of giving the actors and actresses their proper lines. 
Wink and Tom thought it strange that the people on the stage should mumble their lines so badly and behave altogether as they were only half awake and moving by clockwork. Act after act continued in this fashion, but the audience saw only the drama as it was intended. The queen and the ladies wept openly, applying delicate lace handkerchiefs to their eyes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! King Ticket and the lords, being men, contented themselves with brushing away a furtive tear <laughs> and repeatedly blowing their noses loudly in their spotless white linen handkerchiefs. <laughs> Magnificent! exclaimed King Ticket. Glorious! proclaimed Queen Curtain through her tears. This play will run for years. It is one of the most greatest romances we have ever staged. Romance! Sighed King Ticket. Ah, sublime romance. There is nothing in the world so touching and beautiful. It was near the end of the last act. Twink and Tom were nodding. Suddenly, a new actor appeared upon the stage. Twink's half shut eyes flew open. She grasped Tom by the hands and shook him awake. Twiffle leaned forward, holding onto the edge of the box. None of them said a word. For a few seconds, they merely stared unbelievingly. The new character who had come on the stage and was even then mumbling his lines in a mechanical voice was the Shaggy Man. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Shaggy Man in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow A Midnight Adventure At the sight of the shaggy man on the stage, Twink couldn't contain herself. She leaned far out of the box and called, Shaggy Man, here we are. It's Tom, Twiffle, and Twink. If the shaggy man heard, he gave no indication of it. His eyes stared straight ahead of him, and he mumbled the words of his lines as though he were speaking in a dream in which he was only half awake. But King Ticket and Queen Curtain, as well as the audience of lords and ladies, heard. A wave of annoyed shh arose from the audience, while Queen Curtain grabbed Twink by the arm, pulling her back into her seat, and saying angrily, How dare you interrupt the play? For that you shall join your precious shaggy man on the stage tomorrow night. Tom started from his seat indignantly at the Queen's threatening words, but Twiffle, who looked worried, pulled him back. The three unwilling playgoers fell into an uneasy silence. A few moments later, the curtain came down with a crash, and the play was over. Dear, dear me, remarked King Ticket. There go the curtain ropes again. We shall have to repair them tomorrow. Queen Curtain turned to Twiffle and the children. Go to your rooms immediately, she ordered sternly. You know where they are. Don't try to escape. That is impossible. All the doors leading out of the castle are securely locked. And as for you, she said, shooting Twink an angry glance, you will be taken care of tomorrow. Now be gone, all of you. Twink shivered. Tom took her hand, and with Twiffle following, they made their way out of the theater to their rooms. They passed unnoticed through the lords and ladies who were noisily discussing the play exclaiming over its excellence and looking forward to the next night's performance of the same play as soon as they were in their rooms twiffle quickly closed the door and silently motioned the children to his side the little clown was plainly excited listen he whispered to the children i believe i have figured out what has happened to the shaggy man and all the rest of the actors and actresses for that matter. They have been enchanted. 
King Ticket and Queen Curtain have cast some kind of spell upon them so that they are only half awake. The only existence they have is their dreamlike life on the stage as they go through their parts in the play. I see, nodded Twink. I believe you're right. Otherwise Shaggy would surely have answered when I called to him from the box. Of course, said Twiffle. Then you don't think, surmised Tom, that any of the actors and actresses are lords and ladies of the castle? Not a bit of it, stated Twiffle firmly. It is my belief that they are people from adjoining countries, who, like ourselves, have wandered unwittingly into the castle, and have been enchanted for the pleasure of King Ticket, Queen Curtain, and the lords and ladies who have always lived here. You must be right, murmured Twink, recalling how King Ticket had brushed aside their question as to the identity of the actors and actresses. Of course I'm right, asserted Twiffle. It is the only solution that answers all the questions. What we must do now is find a way to rescue the shaggy man tonight before King Ticket and Queen Curtain have a chance to cast their disgusting old spell on Twink tomorrow. Then let's get started, said Tom. What do we do, Twiffle? Nothing now, replied Twiffle. We must wait until everyone in the castle is asleep. Only then will it be safe for us to act. Twink and Tom tried to be calm during the next hour, as they discussed with Twiffle their chances of rescuing the shaggy man and making an escape from the castle. At last Twiffle went quietly to the door and slowly opened it, peering up and down the hall corridor. The entire castle seemed to be wrapped in deep silence. There was not a sound. Come, whispered Twiffle. I believe it is safe to proceed now. Everyone seems to be asleep. You must walk on your tiptoes so your steps won't be heard. Where are we going, Twiffle? whispered Tom. To the theater and then backstage. That is where I am almost sure we will find the shaggy man and all the rest of the unfortunate actors and actresses. The lights of the castle were dim to a soft glow, but this was enough for the adventurers to find their way to the theater with no trouble. Here, the same soft light glowed, filling the theater with a thin, ghostly luminescence. Twiffle quickly led the way down the aisle, then up the small flight of stairs to the stage. Beckoning the children to follow him, Twiffle darted through the wings to the back of the stage. Here an amazing sight greeted them. Lined up in two rows, like soldiers on a drill field, were about fifty men, women, and children. Some of them Twink and Tom recalled having seen on the stage earlier that evening. They ranged in age from small children to elderly men and women. They stood stiffly, as though they were at attention. Their eyes were tight shut. So still were these figures that Twink couldn't tell whether or not they were breathing. In the front row stood the shaggy man. Every type for every part, muttered Twiffle to himself. Then, turning to the children, he whispered, Here they are, just as I suspected, the unfortunate victims of King Ticket and Queen Curtain. They have no more life than mere dummies until the curtain goes up and they walk on the stage to play their parts in that absurd drama. Twiffle approached the shaggy man and studied him intently. At last he sighed and shook his head. I'm afraid there is nothing we can do just now, he admitted. I learned a little magic from Conjo, and I hoped that I might be able to release the shaggy man. But the spell that is upon him is a strange one. I have no power to break it. 
there must surely be something we can do said tom thinking of queen curtain's threatening speech to twink i must have time to think said twiffle at least we have discovered the whereabouts of the shaggy man and we know what has happened to him and all these other poor people there must be some way to release them if only i can hit upon it i suggest we return to our rooms we certainly don't want to be discovered here but what about twink asked tom with dismay i am hoping i can prevent queen curtain from making good her threat replied twiffle grimly oh don't worry about me said twink bravely if worse comes to worst and i don't make a better actress than the rest of these folks i'll be awfully disappointed in myself End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of shaggy man in oz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c shaggy man in oz by jack snow tom goes to the rescue despite the late hour at which they had gone to bed tom awakened bright and early in the morning hurried into his clothes and bounded into twink's room the bed was empty thinking that twink might have risen before him tom dashed into the living room there he found twiffle alone deep in thought twiffle twiffle twink is gone exclaimed tom twiffle nodded his head gravely i know he said i looked for her about half an hour ago and she was gone i was afraid this would happen but this is terrible protested tom think of poor twink one of those senseless dummies just for the amusement of those wicked people the boy was thoroughly incensed as he went on they call this the valley of romance why they must be heartless they don't even know what real romance or love is twiffle let out a shout and leaped to his feet my boy you've done it he cried done what gasped the astonished tom you've just given me the solution to all our problems i now know how we can save not only twink and the shaggy man but all the other people enslaved by king ticket and queen curtain you do said tom wonderingly yes responded twiffle you were wrong about only one thing king ticket queen curtain and the lords and ladies are not heartless they have hearts all right but you were very right when you said they don't know what real romance or love is they don't we're going to show them and in the process we will rescue twink and shaggy twiffle excitedly unfolded his plan as tom listened he grew more and more cheerful when twiffle finished tom picked up the little clown and danced exuberantly about the room with him twiffle the boy shouted you're a wonder twiffle grinned from ear to ear it was you who gave me the idea he reminded tom modestly but we must plan very carefully he went on becoming serious remember there is only a slim chance that our plan will work we must take that chance and hope for the best as there is nothing we can do until tonight when the play is again presented we should make use of this time to work out every single detail of our plan twiffle and tom went over their plan again and again nevertheless the day seemed to tom one of the longest he had ever spent the long hours of waiting were broken only three times when lady q brought in tom's meals the food was quite good but a bit mixed up 
for breakfast the befuddled lady brought tom a large slice of roast beef with cornflakes and apple pie lunch consisted of fried eggs mashed potatoes and doughnuts while dinner was made up of boiled apricots strawberry shortcake and graham crackers but tom was hungry and didn't mind the strange assortment of foods too much he managed to eat everything even though lady q brought him six spoons with each meal and no knives or forks when lady q appeared with the evening meal tom was a bit worried because they had not been asked to dine with the lords and ladies in the royal dining room could this mean they would not be invited to the play if so then their plan of rescue would be ruined twiffle was not worried he was sure they would be asked to share the king and queen's royal box if only as a form of punishment since they would be compelled to see twink as one of the puppets on the stage twiffle proved to be right early in the evening lady q appeared in the doorway and led them again to the theatre king ticket and queen curtain were already settled in the royal box when tom and twiffle arrived except to give them an icy stare the monarchs paid no attention to their guests twiffle winked at tom but both of them were quaking lest twiffle's plan not work if it did not work they would be worse off than ever if possible the play it was the same one was even worse than on the previous night the players went through their parts in a dreamlike fashion chanting their lines woodenly scenery fell apart the curtain came down at the wrong moments and everything possible went wrong but king ticket and queen curtain were enchanted along with the lords and ladies they applauded vociferously and reacted to the ridiculous performance with even more enthusiasm than they had displayed the night before this night tom had no trouble in keeping awake he squirmed about in his seat with impatience waiting until twink and the shaggy man would appear this didn't happen until the play was well into the fourth and last act as on the night before the shaggy man wandered blindly onto the stage speaking the same lines in an almost indistinguishable voice a moment later tom tensed with excitement a new character had been added it was twink her eyes stared as she moved mechanically across the stage murmuring the words of her lines tom took a deep breath and glanced at twiffle the time had come to act twiffle nodded in the next instant tom climbed to the wide rail that encircled the royal box poised there for a moment he gave a leap and landed on the stage without hesitating a moment he dashed to the shaggy man and to the amazement of everyone in the audience except twiffle went through the shaggy man's pockets tom gave an exultant cry he had found what he wanted he held the love magnet before him waving it first at the shaggy man and then at twink shaggy and twink started then rubbed their eyes and stared about them unbelievingly meanwhile tom was busy he didn't hesitate until he had exposed the love magnet to the gaze of each of the enchanted actors and actresses as each one looked at the love magnet he lost his glassy stare and came to life in a few seconds the stage was filled not with dummies but with human beings bewildered but freed from the thraldom of king ticket and queen curtain's evil spell as they recovered several of them threw their arms around tom while all gazed at the boy with fondness and love in their eyes twink suddenly realized how greatly she loved her brother and the first thing that the shaggy man said was a great boy that tom 
Meanwhile, King Ticket and Queen Curtain, as well as the entire audience of lords and ladies, had risen to their feet. None of them spoke. The real drama suddenly being lived on the stage held them fascinated. At this very moment, Tom advanced to the front center of the stage, and with all eyes upon him, flashed the love magnet before the audience. A vast sigh went through the theater, and then there was a confused babble as the lords and ladies crowded into the aisle, each of them bent upon reaching the stage and embracing Tom, who they realized suddenly was quite the most lovable person they had ever beheld. King Ticket leaped from the royal box onto the stage, hurrying towards Tom. My dear boy, he exclaimed, how could I have been so blind? Isn't there something I can do for you? Name it, and you shall have it. My kingdom is yours for the asking. Queen Curtain was standing in the box, arms outstretched, appealing to Tom you darling boy she cried how wonderful it is that you have come to visit us twiffle was sitting quietly in the royal box grinning broadly wouldn't old conjo be surprised he thought if he knew how well the love magnet had done its work tom really is quite a boy end of chapter thirteen Chapter number 14 of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. The Valley of Love. That night there was a great feast in the grand dining room of the castle. Tom was the guest of honor, sitting at the head of the table between King Ticket and Queen Curtain. Twink, feeling very proud of her brother, sat at the queen's right with the shaggy man and Triffle at her side. In addition to the lords and ladies of the castle, all the people who had formerly been actors and actresses were seated about the table. There were speeches, merrymaking, and much laughter, while everyone enjoyed course after course of the delicious food served. King Ticket and Queen Curtain talked together during the feast, seeming to discuss something on which they finally appeared to reach a decision. King Ticket arose and banging with a silver fork against a drinking goblet obtained the attention and silence of the merrymakers my dear friends began the king beaming on his audience good queen curtain and i have been discussing a proposal which we are sure will meet with your approval you are well aware that although we did not know it we the people of the valley of romance have been living in a bondage that was even greater than that which we cast over the poor unfortunates who wandered into the castle for we lived without knowing the meaning of true romance and love we found our only pleasure in artificial romance as we saw it on the stage we have no love for each other no romance among ourselves now all that is changed not only do we now appreciate and know the true meaning of real love but the people whom we enslaved are freed and happy once more we have one person to thank for this tom who with the love magnet brought us our present joy and happiness queen curtain and i propose that we yield our thrones and that tom become the new king of the valley of romance the applause was tremendous apparently everyone in the grand dining room favored king ticket's startling plan 
but tom leaped to his feet and exclaimed your highnesses ladies and gentlemen thank you for this great honor but i cannot be your king maybe i'll never get the chance to be a king again but the important thing for twink and me is to find our way home the shaggy man has promised that ozma of oz will send us home if we can only reach oz that is the thing we want most anyway i have no right to be your king i don't know anything about the job and you should really be grateful to the love magnet for making you happy not me now that you folks know the meaning of real love i'm sure king ticket will make you a fine king and queen curtain will be a real queen again the applause resounded at last king ticket rose again expressing his regret that tom could not remain with them to be their king king ticket promised that he would do his best to be a kind and loving monarch his first move he said would be to grant complete freedom to the people who had wandered to the castle and had become slaves on the stage of false romance these people he said might return to their own homes or they might if they wished remain to dwell as lords and ladies in the castle of romance since they would have no further use for the theatre king ticket promised to have the seats removed and the theatre remodeled into a real temple of learning where each of his subjects might learn some craft or art that would be useful or pleasing to his fellows here they would meet each day and study and work at their arts and crafts enjoying companionship and the satisfaction of real accomplishment and creation if you do manage to get to the land of oz king ticket said to the shaggy man i wonder if you would ask professor wogglebug if he would like to come to our temple of learning as a visiting professor i am sure there are many things he could teach us that would be both interesting and useful shaggy promised to extend the invitation to the learned wogglebug who was the head of the royal college of oz in spite of all the excitement twink and tom were nodding by the time the feasting and speech-making were ended everyone bade them happy good night and lady q conducted them once more to their rooms the love magnet had wrought its change on lady q too gone was her formal befuddled state in which she was not at all sure of anything or any one now she was a charming gracious lady with the manners of a cordial and perfect hostess shaggy and the children were fast asleep almost as soon as their heads touched the soft pillows twiffle passed the night looking at the pictures in the books on the living room shelves by the middle of the following morning they were ready to begin their adventures again they found that king ticket queen curtain the lords and ladies and the former actors and actresses many of whom had decided to make their homes in the valley of romance were gathered in the courtyard to bid them farewell king ticket gave them general directions for traveling to reach the deadly desert that was the nearest he could come to directing them to the land of oz just as they were about to leave lady q arrived breathlessly on the scene she was so excited that she nearly lapsed into her old bewildered state i i i have been so busy all morning cooking this for you that i was afraid i would miss you lady q looked anxiously at shaggy and his friends as though she couldn't believe they were still there as she spoke she handed shaggy a large lunch basket filled with deliciously prepared good things to eat shaggy twink tom and even twiffle who didn't eat 
thanked Lady Q warmly for her thoughtfulness. They were glad she had not changed entirely, for they had grown fond of her. As they turned away from her and started once again on their journey, Lady Q was staring after them and dabbing at her eyes with a dishcloth. Waving goodbye, the little band of adventurers followed the stream to the south as it wound through the green and peaceful valley of romance. When they were almost out of sight of the castle of romance, Twink looked back and saw the delicately fashioned spires shimmering in the sun. Now, the girl said, it is truly as beautiful a castle as it looks. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow, The King of the Fairy Beavers. Beyond the valley, the country became rugged and rolling, with outcroppings of grey rock, while the river narrowed, grew deeper, and flowed much more swiftly. It was well into the afternoon when the shaggy man suggested that they rest under a gnarled tree near the river bank and enjoy their luncheon. They were all glad for the rest on the grass which grew high and coarse over the countryside and the food which lady q had packed for them was both satisfying and delicious twink took a long look at the rather forbidding scenery about them in the distance loomed dark mountain peaks while trees became fewer and fewer doesn't look like there's a living thing within miles said the little girl a bit disconsolately in a way that's a good sign replied the shaggy man for the nearer we come to the deadly desert the more wild and desolate the country is from the looks of things here i wouldn't be surprised if we were near the kingdom of the gnomes have you any idea how we can get to oz once we arrive at the deadly desert asked twiffle no said the shaggy man i haven't but one can never tell what will happen when traveling in a fairy country and i figure the closer we are to the deadly desert the closer we are to oz now if i just hadn't lost umza's magic compass but there's no use crying over spilt milk did i understand you to say you are going to the land of oz the words were spoken in a small clear voice at the same time the tall grass just in front of shaggy and his friends parted and a beaver stepped out and viewed them fearlessly twink was amazed to see the beaver wore a small golden crown on his head while in his right paw he carried a slender beech rod yes said the shaggy man calmly regarding the beaver while he continued to munch a peanut butter and jelly sandwich that is we hope to get to the land of oz first we must find some way to cross the deadly desert the beaver was silent for a moment then he said will you take me to oz with you take you with us exclaimed the shaggy man why we aren't at all sure we can get there ourselves but why do you want to go to oz i could tell by your crown that you're a king of some sort and not an ordinary beaver i am the king of the fairy beavers announced the little animal a bit proudly none of us are ordinary beavers since we are fairy creatures and as for why i want to visit oz well i have heard wonderful tales of that famous fairyland and i have long dreamed of visiting it 
seems to me observed tom that since you are a fairy king your magical powers could take you to oz no replied the beaver king my magic is mostly water magic and that would be less than useless on the fiery sands of the deadly desert but that isn't the main reason that keeps me from visiting oz what is it then asked shaggy i have not been invited replied the beaver king simply i am sure that if ozma knew about that she would fix it said the shaggy man kindly do you think so asked the beaver do you really think ozma would invite me i hope you would say that for it gives me courage to put forth a suggestion i have in mind what is that asked shaggy if you the famous shaggy man of oz were to invite me to visit oz then everything would be quite proper wouldn't it i suppose it would admitted the shaggy man smiling but how do you propose to get to oz since we can't cross the desert then you really invite me to accompany you that is wonderful as for the deadly desert i have a plan which might work how did you know who the shaggy man was asked twink oh everyone knows about the shaggy man of oz and when i saw you here discussing your journey to oz i was almost sure this could be none other than the famous shaggy man shaggy looked modestly down at the ground twiffle asked just how far are we from the deadly desert quite a distance replied the beaver king the desert lies just beyond our own kingdom which is in the hills and mountains you see in the distance and what is your plan for crossing it asked the shaggy man come to my palace where you will be comfortable said the king and we will discuss my plan it must be a long walk sighed twink and the farther we go toward the desert the rockier and grayer the country becomes oh we shan't walk it will be much quicker to ride declared the beaver king with that the king of the fairy beavers walked to the edge of the stream and uttered a shrill whistle shaggy and his friends followed the little animal a few hundred feet below them the river curved to the left around this bend in the stream they could now see some twenty little heads beavers swimming swiftly upstream and pulling after them a barge-like boat with a canopy to shut out the rays of the sun in a few moments the boat was drawing near the shore on which they stood twink could see that each of the little beavers wore a harness connected to the boat by a rope of woven reeds the boat itself was brightly painted and filled with soft silken cushions you will be my guests on the journey down the river to my kingdom where it will give me great pleasure to welcome you to my humble abode twink tom the shaggy man and twiffle stepped into the boat the shaggy man had to stoop a bit to miss the canopy but once they were seated on the soft cushions there was room for all the king of the fairy beavers hitched himself into the front of the harness with the other beavers i hope you forgive me for not riding with you he said but when i have guests i like to do my share of the work we beavers always enjoy working together you know and occasions like this give me an opportunity to forget i'm a king the boat moved swiftly down the river pulled easily by the team of strong little animals well this certainly beats walking your majesty said the shaggy man as he sighed with content and settled back among the cushions End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of Shaggy Man in Oz。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow In Beaver Land Tom, who was especially fond of animals, longed to hold one of the little beavers and fondle it to his heart's content. And what fun it would be, the boy thought, just to jump into the stream and swim along with the busily paddling happy-looking little animals but tom contented himself with marveling at the ease with which the beavers pulled the boat although the journey consumed more than an hour it did not seem nearly that long to the travelers who were kept busy watching the changing scenery as the boat sped swiftly downstream the banks of the river grew much steeper and they could scarcely see any trees while gray rocks jutted out from the earth and forbidding mountain peaks loomed only a few miles distant the beavers swam out of the current of the river and drew the boat into a placid pool among the rocks at the far end of the pool there was a stairway leading from a wooden landing to a wicker door set in the face of a cliff of gray stone that ran steeply down to the pond's edge the fairy beavers seemed to be full of energy and untired by the journey as they chattered among themselves drawing the boat to the landing and making it secure the shaggy man looked about him and observed to the king i always thought your majesty that beavers liked to live where there was plenty of wood i've heard tell of them building whole series of dams from trees they had gnawed down even human engineers have taken some lessons in water control from the beavers you're right replied the king of the fairy beavers but those beavers you heard about were of the ordinary kind not that we fairy beavers don't do a lot of engineering we do but we prefer this desolate region for our home since we are less likely to be disturbed here and any trees we may need we can always fell and float downstream from the more fertile lands as he spoke the beaver king ascended the steps to the wicker door and swung it open the shaggy man had to stoop to enter but once inside he found he could stand with ease it took a few minutes for shaggy and his friends to adjust their eyes from the glare of the sun on the water to the lighting of the cave in which they stood for that was what it was a vast cave in the cliff a fairy light of silver white issued from the rock walls and dome of the cave the cavern proved to be merely the ante-room of the beaver kingdom which consisted of a labyrinth of large and small tunnels burrowed into the earth at the rear of the cave sleek well-fed beavers hurried in and out of the burrows bent upon the tasks that made up their daily work indeed every one in this underground kingdom seemed to be hard at work and intently busy on one task or another new tunnels were being constructed and reinforced with carefully hewn beams of wood new rooms and homes were under construction and there didn't seem to be an idle moment with all the work that was going on the beaver king was perhaps even busier than his subjects and while he was gracious and did everything in his power to make his guests comfortable they got the impression that even while he was chatting with them his mind was busy with new plans and ideas for the improvement of his kingdom the king of the fairy beavers hesitated only long enough for shaggy and his friends to glance about them and then led his guests down one of the burrows which was really a good-sized tunnel a short distance down this passage the beaver king paused before a large granite door set in the tunnel's side 
just above the door was mounted a golden crown it is my pleasure said the beaver king as the heavy door swung open to welcome you to my royal suite where i hope you will accept my humble hospitality there was a large reception hall then a huge throne room that could easily accommodate an assemblage of several thousand beavers and finally a dining room with mirrored walls and ceiling and a scrumptiously laid table shaggy and his friends were amazed at the elegance and beauty of their surroundings the dining room table was set with the finest of china and the linens were snowy white and hand woven the king of the fairy beavers still carried the slender beech rod which twink had noticed in his right paw when he had first appeared among them that afternoon after inviting his guests to be seated at the table the beaver king waved the beech rod which twink and tom had already guessed to be his magic wand and at once the table was loaded with the most savory dishes imaginable i don't ordinarily like to employ magic unless it is necessary the beaver king explained we beavers prefer to work for what we get but magic affords the quickest manner of providing the strange foods that you human beings seem to enjoy twiffle and the beaver king conversed while shaggy twink and tom enjoyed the food they were much hungrier than they realized the ride on the river had given them a tremendous appetite when they had finished eating the king of the fairy beavers said now my friends would be a good time to plan our trip to the land of oz no one said a word but every eye was fixed with eager attention on the little animal we cannot fly over the deadly desert the beaver king went on nor can we cross it the devouring sands would mean quick death for all of us then we're just not going to oz i guess said tom sadly oh yes i think we are replied the beaver king quickly there is one way left to cross the desert a hush fell over the company as they waited for the beaver king's next words we can cross under the desert he said simply you have burrowed clear under the deadly desert to oz asked shaggy man incredulously no replied the king of the fairy beavers we have not but someone else has and who is that asked twink the gnome king said the beaver king end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of shaggy man in oz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow The Tunnel Under the Desert The Shaggy Man leapt to his feet and stared at the Beaver King. What? he exclaimed. You discovered the Gnome King's tunnel under the deadly desert? Oh, yes replied the beaver king we have known for some time of its existence and location but this is wonderful gasped the shaggy man our troubles are all over all we have to do is walk through the tunnel to the emerald city no said the king of the fairy beavers it isn't as easy as that you must remember we still have Galinda's barrier of invisibility to contend with. Hmm, said the shaggy man, seating himself. That is true. But there might be some way we could get past that barrier. Tell me, how did you happen to discover the Gnome King's tunnel? We stumbled into it accidentally when one of our burrows led into it explained the beaver king 
We followed it to the kingdom of the gnomes, where the tunnel opens into one of the gnome king's mines. There was a company of gnomes working there, and the ill-natured creatures hurled diamonds at us. In fact, the gnomes were so discourteous that we have never since entered that section of the tunnel. But if you knew the tunnel led to Oz in the other direction, why didn't you follow it? asked Twiffle. Because we also know Ozma's wishes, and we respect them, replied the Beaver King quietly. But certainly Ozma would not object to the Shaggy Man and his friends using the tunnel. And since the Shaggy Man has so kindly invited me to visit Oz, I feel perfectly free to accompany him. Then you know the story of the tunnel the Gnome King built under the deadly desert to the Emerald City? asked the Shaggy Man. Our fairy powers keep us informed of important happenings, not only in Oz, but in all other parts of the world, replied the Beaver King. Twink and Tom knew the story, too. They had read how the Gnome King, seeking revenge on Ozma and Dorothy, because they had once conquered him, set his gnomes to burying a tunnel from the Gnome Kingdom to the Emerald City. When it was finished, Roquat the Red, as the Gnome King was known then, and a horde of evil allies marched through the tunnel, intent on conquering and laying waste all of Oz. Ozma refused to fight, but instead gathered all her closest friends about her, in the garden near the Fountain of Oblivion, where the invaders were about to break through from the tunnel. The famous scarecrow of Oz had given Ozma the idea that had saved her from the necessity of fighting. The tunnel was hot and dry, and Ozma had used her magic powers to scatter dust throughout the underground passage. As a result, when the Gnome King and his allies came bursting through the earth, they were consumed with a terrible thirst. The first thing they saw was the Fountain of Oblivion. Just as the Scarecrow had planned, they all dashed to the fountain and drank. The waters of the fountain cause anyone who drinks it to lose all memory of their former life. Consequently, the Gnome King and all his allies became as harmless as little children, having forgotten their former evil lies. Ozma had sent them back by means of the magic belt to her own lands and then closed the earth over the tunnel's entrance into her garden soon after that glinda had laid down the magic barrier of invisibility over the deadly desert which ozma hoped would prevent any other invaders from attacking the land of oz trying to get through the tunnel really seems the only thing to do said the shaggy man thoughtfully that will be far better than just sitting and waiting for ozma to return to the emerald city i had no idea how long she plans to visit with glinda i suppose the only thing we can do is to try deal with the barrier of invisibility when we come to it perhaps your majesty's magic could overcome it the beaver king was thoughtful perhaps he said but you must remember glinda's magic is very powerful we may discover that the desert is just as impassable underground as it is above ground so don't let us raise our hopes too high my friends at any rate he concluded we will undertake the journey in the morning and then we shall know the beaver king led his guests into his throne room where comfortable seats were provided. Next, a troop of beaver acrobats came running into the throne room. They wore brightly colored tights and put on a performance of such skill and daring that Twink and Tom were delighted. The animals were amazingly agile, and some of their tumbling tricks 
were so droll that even twiffle laughed aloud i never saw anything to beat this at the circus tom confided to twink as the twins loudly applauded when the entertainment was over it was growing late and saying he had some work to do in his magic workshop in preparation for the journey in the morning the beaver king led his guests to a suite of beautifully furnished sleeping rooms twink and tom were not a bit surprised the beaver king should work while they slept indeed they wondered if anyone in this busy little kingdom ever took time off to rest as soon as you lie down on the beds the beaver king told twink and tom you'll be lulled to sleep by the most beautiful music in the world with that he closed the door softly and left them twink and tom were in their beds in no time at all eager to hear the music the beaver king had promised them no sooner had their heads touched the pillows than they heard it it was like the sleepy murmuring of a thousand voices there were no words only a soft whisper that seemed to come from a great distance and yet was close by was everywhere twink closed her eyes and the wordless music sang of green meadows under a golden sun of mountain rills that trip from stone to stone down to beautiful valleys of great rivers that flowed through the hearts of vast lands and finally of the sea itself singing eternally of endless wonders just before tom dropped off to sleep he said twink i know what it is the beaver king said it was the most beautiful music in the world and it is i know said twink sleepily it's the music of running water end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of shaggy man and oz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kyle donnellan shaggy man and oz by jack snow chapter eighteen the flame folk early the next morning shaggy and his friends found a steaming hot breakfast waiting for them in their rooms no sooner had they finished than the king of the fairy beavers appeared to lead them to the gnome king's tunnel they followed the king through several miles of weaving and twisting beaver burrows until at last they stood at the entrance of the tunnel shaggy had noted that the king bore on his back like a tiny knapsack a small bundle now he saw that the twenty young beavers who were waiting at the tunnel's entrance to undertake a journey with them bore similar though smaller bundles on their backs in addition each of the young beavers carried a pine torch to light their way through the dark tunnel at a signal from the beaver king the torch-bearing beavers advanced into the tunnel and the journey was on how far are we from the deadly desert inquired the shaggy man not more than a mile answered the beaver king we will know when we reach the desert because of the heat radiated downward by the sands the tunnel is not far from the surface no more than twenty feet i would judge the tunnel was hewn from solid rock but the floor of it was smooth so the travelers were able to proceed at a good rate of speed they all noticed that the heat increased perceptibly the closer they came to the shifting sands above them wee you exclaimed the shaggy man this is no place for a pleasure trip i could see why the gnome king was thirsty when he got out of here they were now directly under the deadly desert and the heat radiated by the shifting sands above them was intense but twink and tom were lightly dressed so they didn't mind the heat so much twiffle naturally paid not the slightest attention to the temperature the beavers who were used to the underground heat moved swiftly forward the pine torches of the young beavers cast flickering shadows on the rough stone walls about the travelers but suddenly the light of their torches dimmed and faded in a greater brilliance the torch-bearing beavers stopped in their tracks and were chattering excitedly amongst themselves waiting for the beaver king and his party to catch up with them the travelers hurried forward and found to their amazement that the new light came from a rift in the rock roof sunlight was shining down into the tunnel but no sooner had they recovered from the surprise than they were overwhelmed by another 
Directly ahead of them, blocking their passage through the tunnel, was a group of the strangest people they had ever seen. These beings were human in shape, yet they seemed to be made of flame. The living fire that formed their bodies varied in hue from a deep glowing red to light orange and yellow, while their fingertips, eyes, and features gave off blue and greenish colored flames. There were perhaps ten of the creatures, standing side by side so that the beaver king and his friends found their way completely blocked by the wall of living flame. Waves of heat radiated from their flaming bodies, and Twink and Tom had to blink their eyes several times to become accustomed to the glare of flame and light. Halt! You can go no further. Turn back at once to whence you came. One of the flame folk was speaking. He appeared to be their leader, since he was taller than his companions, and his eyes glowed much more fiercely than the rest. Who are you? asked the beaver king calmly. We are dwellers of the desert. We live on the shifting sands on the surface. Occasionally we visit the oasis just above, where there is no sand, but blue grass that glows with blue flame, the flame being answered. An oasis on the deadly desert? asked the shaggy man incredulously. Certainly. Did you ever hear of a desert that didn't have an oasis? replied the fire creature. Maybe not, muttered the shaggy man. And I oppose the flame grass keeps the deadly sand from shifting into the tunnel. Exactly, replied the fire creature. But we are not concerned with sand in the tunnel. There are other things much more objectionable. Yourselves, for instance. How did you find out about the tunnel? asked the beaver king, ignoring the fire being's insult. Not that it was any of your business, but we were aware of the tunnel's existence while the gnome king was building it. After he returned to his own silly kingdom, we burned our way down through the rocks from the oasis above. Why did you do that? persisted the beaver king. The leader of the fire creatures hesitated for a moment, then replied in an angry voice, Because we enjoy the coolness of the tunnel. By contrast, it makes the fiery sands of the desert even more pleasant. Now be on your way back where you came from, or we will advance upon you and blast you to cinders. My, what a fiery-tempered fellow, said Shaggy. This seemed to infuriate the fire creature, and he was about to leap towards Shaggy when the beaver king stepped forward, holding out his beechwood wand. Instantly, from the tip of the wand, there came forth a spray of water that showered on the row of fire creatures. As soon as it touched their flaming bodies, the water hissed into steam. The effect on the fire beings was amazing. They uttered loud howls of pain and fright, and leaped like flames from a great fire into the air and through the rift in the rock. Their cries resounded as they dashed over the oasis to roll in the flaming sands of the desert. Come, urged the beaver king. Let us hurry, although I do not think there is any danger of pursuit. Young beavers went first, followed by Shaggy and his friends. They hurried until they had passed out in the sight of the sunlight that flowed down the rift into the tunnel. I guess that's the first time those creatures ever saw water, said the shaggy man, grinning. The water didn't hurt them, said the beaver king. The burning sands will soon restore whatever heat they lost. Nevertheless, I don't think they will cause us any further annoyance. They walked ahead rapidly, hour after hour, with the young beavers, lighting the way through the gnome king's tunnel. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of Shaggy Man and Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kyle Donnellan. Shaggy Man and Oz by Jack Snow. Chapter Nineteen. The Barrier of Invisibility. Suddenly, Shaggy stopped and stared about him. He was alone in the tunnel. He had been walking along, looking at nothing in particular, when in a flash his companions had vanished. Just ahead of him he could hear the excited chattering of the twenty young beavers, but there was no sign of any living thing. Then Shaggy looked down at himself and cried out in amazement. He wasn't there either. He could see nothing of his body, although he felt as firm as ever. You will be kind enough to remove your wand from my eye, please. It was Twiffle's voice, speaking somewhere near Shaggy. I beg you pardon. We are both invisible, so my poking my wand in your eye was entirely unintentional, I assure you, the Beaver King's voice answered. 
Hey, stay off my foot, Tom called out. Was that your foot? I'm sure I didn't see it, Twink's voice answered soothingly. Neither do I, but it's there just the same, replied Tom's voice ruefully. All about them, the young beavers' voices had risen, and several angry disputes were taking place. Evidently, some accidents had occurred among the little animals, too. The shaggy man said sadly, Well, this seems to be the barrier of invisibility, and it's most effective, too. I propose we all stay just where we are until we decide what to do, for we all seem to be quite invisible. Must we turn back? asked Twink anxiously. Don't you worry, Twink, said Tom. Even if we can't get to the land of Oz, we'll find our way home. Yes, I think we must turn back, announced the Beaver King. Let us retreat in the tunnel to the point where the barrier of invisibility begins. It should be only a few feet from where we are now, since we just entered it. But we have turned about and lost all sense of direction since becoming invisible, said the Shaggy Man. Since we cannot see the tunnel, it looks the same in every direction. So how are we to know which way to turn to go back? Walk ten steps in one direction, and if you are still invisible, then turn about and walk twenty feet in the other direction, instructed the Beaver King. This they all did, and after a bit of experimentation and several minor collisions, they were relieved to find themselves visible once more, and standing on the edge of the barrier of invisibility. At the King's orders, the young beavers had remained where they were, until the others had found their way out of the barrier. Now the Beaver King uttered a series of calls that quickly guided the animals beyond the barrier of invisibility. Shaggy and his friends stood about in the tunnel, gazing from one to another, almost despairingly, wondering what to do next. There is still hope that we may not have to go back and may be able to use the tunnel to reach Oz, my friends, began the Beaver King quietly. Last night and far into the morning, while you were sleeping, I was busy in my fairy workshop studying the problem. I believe I have solved it, although, of course, we cannot be sure until we make the test. With this, the little animal unstrapped from his back the small bundle he had been carrying. Laying it on the tunnel floor, he carefully unfolded it. The bundle seemed to consist of a number of shimmering pieces of silver cloth, so light that may have been spun from spider webs. The Beaver King selected one of the folds of gossamer cloth and handed it to Twink. Unfold it and put it about you, my dear, he said. I think you will find it just your size. Twink did as instructed, and found the cloth fitted about her like a fairy cloak. Oh, it's lovely, she exclaimed. It's more than that, I hope, said the Beaver King. It is a cloak of visibility. A cloak of what? exclaimed the shaggy man. You have all heard and read tales of cloaks of invisibility, explained the Beaver King. Cloaks that make the wearer invisible are famous in the fairy tales of all lands. Well, I knew that we would become invisible today against our wishes, so I have attempted to create a cloak of visibility, a cloak that would overcome the spell of invisibility. Do you think it will work? asked the shaggy man hopefully. I do not know, confessed the beaver king. I am sure it wouldn't work above ground, where Glinda's barrier of invisibility is at full strength. Underground, Glinda's spell is much less intense because the earth and sands absorb and destroy the fairy spell. Glinda is a fairy just as Ozma is, and fairies, you know, are creatures of the light and the air, and it is there that their powers are the strongest. The Beaver King then handed out cloaks of the shimmering material to all of them. There was a tiny one that fitted Twiffle perfectly. The twenty young beavers opened their knapsacks and drew from them their own cloaks of visibility, which they adjusted about themselves. Now we are ready to test the power of the cloaks, said the Beaver King. They should not only make us visible, but should enable us to see the invisible. Twink thought she detected the slightest tremor in the King's voice. It was no wonder, she thought, for so much depended on those cloaks he had made. Once again they proceeded into the tunnel, this time holding their breaths with excitement. Would the cloaks of visibility work? One, two, three, four... Five steps, and they found themselves watching one another to see if they were still visible. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten steps. But no one breathed freely until they had counted twenty steps. They all were still visible, and they could see the tunnel walls. The cloaks of visibility worked perfectly. Eagerly, the twenty young beavers took the lead again. End of chapter 19
Chapter 20 of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kyle Donnellan. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. Chapter 20 At the End of the Tunnel. Seems to me, remarked the Shaggy Man after they had progressed for some distance, that by now we have crossed the barrier of invisibility. You're right, agreed the Beaver King, and that means we are now journeying underground in the land of Oz. It also means that the cloaks of visibility are no longer necessary for our journey. So I propose that we discard them here, and I will destroy them so that they may never be used by anyone else for reaching the land of Oz. Each of the travelers removed his shimmering cloak and placed it on a little pile in the center of the tunnel. When all the cloaks were there, the beaver king waved his beechwood wand over the little heap of silvery material, and in a flash it had vanished. It seems a shame, murmured Twink. They were so beautiful. But Twink forgot the cloaks as they journeyed on. She and Tom could scarcely believe it. Just over their heads was the marvelous land of Oz. They began talking of all the famous people who lived in Oz, and the boy and girl would probably have been walked all night had not the king of the fairy beavers announced that they had been trudging steadily for more than six hours. My fairy powers tell me it is dark in the land above. That means we have been walking all day. I propose we stop and sleep here and resume our journey in the morning. We should reach the Emerald City shortly after noon. The shaggy man looked a bit ruefully at the hard stone floor of the tunnel. Well, he sighed, in my wanderings I have slept in less comfortable places. Twink can have my coat to rest her head on. The beaver king chuckled softly. Don't worry, shaggy man, he said. I will provide beds for us. First, let us enjoy a good dinner so that we may sleep the more soundly. After the dinner, two small beds and a large one magically appeared for Twink, Tom, and Shaggy. Although he did not need to sleep, Twiffle was provided with a little bed just his size. The beaver king curled up on a silken cushion. Other cushions were provided for the young beaver torchbearers, who took turns throughout the night sleeping and standing guard. The next morning found them refreshed and eager to be on their way toward the Emerald City. The tunnel was cool now, and they advanced rapidly. They were all weary of the sameness of the rocky tunnel walls, and eager to reach the land of Oz. At last, the young beavers who were leading the way came to a halt. For some distance, the travelers had noticed that the tunnel had been gently sloping upward. Now they had arrived at its end. Just before them was a round patch of earth, a sort of cork of earth that Ozma had set in the end of the tunnel where it emerged in her garden. The young beavers knew exactly what to do. They set to work digging and burrowing around the rim of this patch of earth. When they had loosened it sufficiently, it would roll back into the tunnel, leaving free the exit for the shaggy man and his friends to emerge from the underground passage. Twink and Tom watched in fascinated silence while the beavers worked. They were amazingly fast and skillful. Their paws fairly flew as they scooped out the earth, then brushed it from behind them with their wide, flat tails. In a few more seconds, the beavers would be through the earth. The beaver king warned his comrades to step back in the tunnel, as the earth was about to come tumbling down. There was a creaking and crashing of earth and stones, and the beavers dashed to safety. Suddenly, loud roars of mingled anger and fright filled the tunnel. Sitting on the pile of earth that had crashed down into the tunnel, and glaring at them frightfully while he roared, was an enormous beast. End of chapter 20、Chapter、Number 21 All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. The Wizard is excited. The great beast that had plunged into the tunnel suddenly stopped roaring. Shook the gravel and dirt from his mane and back, and said calmly, "I'm surprised at you, Shaggy Man. What do you mean by digging holes in Ozama's garden 
and leaving them open for unsuspecting folks to fall into i might very easily have broken a leg or fractured a paw the shaky man was grinning broadly ten to one you were running away from something in an effort to work up your well-known but careful courage to the point of fighting the huge lion looked down at the ground in embarrassment you seem to know this great beast said the beaver king who had been regarding the sudden entrant into the tunnel with intense curiosity indeed i do replied the shaggy man he's an old friend of mine and quite harmless if he is your friend for this you see is the famous cowardly lion of oz twink and tom had been staring with fascination at the huge lion it was the first time they had ever come face to face with so great a beast and although they had read so much about the famous cowardly lion of oz they recognized him he had looked so fierce when he had fallen into the tunnel that they would surely have been frightened had it not been for shaggy's reassuring words i don't know what this is all about shaggy sighed the lion i was told ozama had sent you out of the country on an errand for her and now you turn up in a hole in her garden with a group of strange people and animals it can all be explained soothed the shaggy man meanwhile do you think you can help us out of here of course replied the cowardly lion any friends of yours are friends of mine just climb on my back and you will have no difficulty in pulling yourselves to the level ground those little animals don't bite do they the great lion looked anxiously at the beaver's sharp teeth with a laugh shaggy assured him he had nothing to fear the beavers and their king went first followed by twink and tom who found the lion's coat to be delightfully thick and soft and finally by twiffle and the shaggy man the cowardly lion leapt from the tunnel and surveyed shaggy and his friends children animals and a wooden clown all popping up from what i now perceive is the gnome king's tunnel and not just a hole in the ground as i thought when i first tumbled into it tell me shaggy have you had trouble with the gnome king again shaggy started to relate his adventures but after a few words the cowardly lion interrupted him that can wait you can tell me all about it later the important thing is that you are here safely and i almost forgot there is plenty going on here what do you mean asked the shaggy man well to tell you the truth i was running because i was frightened then the ground gave way beneath me and i fell into the tunnel but why were you frightened persisted the shaggy man something is going on in the royal palace that i don't understand the wizard is very excited he claims someone has stolen his black bag of magic tools and locked the door of the tower that leads to his magic workshop so he can't get in i overheard him telling dorothy about it and they both seemed very upset i decided i had better hide somewhere until i had gathered enough courage to lead an attack on the enemy the shaggy man smiled to himself you come with us he said to the lion first i want you to meet my friends twink tom twiffle and the king of the fairy beavers then we must find the wizard and dorothy and see what this is all about the cowardly lion acknowledged the introduction so cordially that twink and tom felt as if they had been friends for years they all walked through the beautiful gardens of ozama's royal palace until they came to a large french door leading into a study here by a stroke of good luck 
they found princess dorothy and the wizard of oz deep in conversation dorothy and the wizard looked up in amazement as shaggy and his strangely assorted band of followers trailed into the study introductions were made again and this time twink and tom were very nearly tongue-tied as they realized they were actually in the company of a real princess of the fairyland of oz and the one and only wizard of oz but dorothy was so friendly and sweet that the little boy and girl felt quite at ease almost at once shaggy told his story as briefly as possible and then asked the wizard for an explanation of what had been happening in the palace i wish i could tell you more definitely said the wizard ruefully but i am as mystified as any one here is all i know i had ordered the royal stables to have the sawhorse saddled so that i might ride him to the college of natural history where i wished to consult some of the books written by professor wooglebird i had placed on the ground my black bag of magic tools which i needed for some experiments i planned to make at the college i was about to mount the sawhorse and picked up the bag when suddenly from out of nowhere a wild-eyed little man appeared he gave me one stare picked up my black bag and dashed into the palace i was so startled that it was several moments before i called him to stop then i went dashing into the palace after him but the little man was nowhere to be seen i hurried to dorothy's rooms and she accompanied me to the throne room just as we entered the throne room the little man whisked past us and was up the tower stairs that led to my magic workroom did he have the black bag then asked shaggy no that's the strange part of it he did not replied the wizard he locked the tower door securely after him so dorothy and i couldn't follow we have searched everywhere but there's just not a single trace of the black bag twink and tom listened spellbound by the wizard's story here they were not only in the emerald city of oz but in the midst of an adventure that excited even the famous wizard of oz i just can't understand it said the wizard rubbing his bald head perplexedly well can't we break down the door to the tower asked dorothy perhaps we could but there are six other doors after that one before my magic workroom can be reached and all are protected by my own magic groaned the wizard are there no other magic tools that can be used inquired shaggy none said the wizard despondently ozma took dorothy's magic belt with her when she went to visit glinda so we are helpless for the moment twiffle had been listening with great interest now he said tell me was the little man who suddenly appeared quite fat and bald save for a fringe of white hair and did he have blue eyes and a sort of cherry-like nose why yes that describes him quite well from the glimpse i had of him said the wizard thoughtfully i think twiffle went on quietly that if you had had the opportunity to observe him more closely you would have seen that he wore on his wrist ozama's magic compass end of chapter twenty one chapter number twenty two of shaggy man in oz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. Conjo in Control. Conjo exclaimed the Shaggy Man. Of course, that's who it is. He used Ozma's magic compass to bring him to the Emerald City, and then started his mischief. I wonder what he wants, what his purpose is in hiding my black bag and then locking himself in the tower, mused the wizard. Perhaps, said Dorothy, it would be a good thing if Twiffle told us all he knows about this conjo since he seems to be better acquainted with him than anyone else is a good idea agreed the wizard and they all turned to twiffle the little clown recounted his life with conjo telling all he could remember from the time when conjo brought him to life to his escape with shaggy and twink and tom in the airmobile the wizard considered Apparently, the only really bad thing Conjo has done is to take these children out of their home and plan to make them prisoners. Outside of that, he has been merely selfish, lazy, and foolishly vain. Perhaps if we tried to talk with them, we could prove the folly of his latest actions. He must know that as soon as Ozma returns, he will be helpless before her fairy powers the wizard led the way to ozma's grand throne room on one side of which was the door that led to the tower and magic workroom the young beavers and their king hurried along after the wizard and shaggy and the rest perhaps conjo would listen to you the wizard suggested to twiffle if you asked him to come out and talk with us twiffle walked to the tower door knocked as loudly as he could on it and said come out conjo it is foolish of you to hide away in there these people want to talk with you and try to be your friends everyone waited with hushed breath had conjo heard would he come out after a few moments the door opened a crack then slowly further and further until conjo stood revealed in the doorway the little man was quivering with excitement yes conjo said with what was meant to be a smile i will talk to you but don't any of you come one step nearer this door if you do I will transform you all into doormats and jumping jacks what do you want asked the wizard quietly why have you hidden my black bag of magic tools and shut me off from my magic workroom you should be able to figure that out replied conjo i had to do that to render you helpless without your magic you are powerless to defend yourselves i now have at my command all your magic as well as my own so i rather think you will be glad enough to do as i say and just what is that asked the wizard from now on said conjo i am the wizard of oz and you conjo pointed to the wizard are my assistant dorothy gasped at the audacity of the little man while the shaggy man laughed aloud the wizard could only whisper unbelievingly you want to be me no said conjo who seemed relaxed now and enjoying the consternation he had created i want to be the wizard of oz it's only a title you know and i deserve it just as much as you i'm tired of being a wizard nobody knows about now i have all your magic so who is there to say i am not the wizard of oz ho 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 ha ha he 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 the little man seemed vastly amused ozma will have something to say about this said dorothy indignantly 
if you think she'll let you come in here and steal all the wizard's magic and then try to steal his name on top of all that you're very badly mistaken i'll take care of ozma when the time comes after all she's only a girl said conjo easily and now if you'll excuse me i think i'll go up and study the wizard magic please set a place for me at dinner i shall be quite hungry and don't bother to look for the wizard's black bag you'll never find it ha 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 ho ho he 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 conjo was about to close the door when the king of the fairy beavers raised his beechwood wand from the tip of it came a stream of water that played directly on conjo's face conjo gasped and sputtered opened his mouth to cry out and the stream of water filled his mouth he choked and swallowed a large amount of the water immediately the stream ceased flowing from the beaver's king wand conjo stared at them all with innocent wonder in his eyes where am i he said end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of shaggy man in oz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c shaggy man in oz by jack snow chapter twenty three twiffle says good-bye Conjo wandered from the doorway of the tower toward the wizard and his friends. Do you know who I am? he asked the wizard amiably. Then the fat little man saw the young beavers. He immediately seated himself on the floor and called to the animals to play with him. I think his majesty, the king of the fairy beavers, can't explain what has happened to Conjo, said the wizard it is very simple replied the beaver king as i have told you i am fairly proficient in water magic so when i saw that conjo could not be talked out of his mischievousness and that he meant further trouble i directed a stream of water through my fairy wand toward conjo the water came from ozma's fountain of oblivion then conjo has forgotten all his bad ways and all his magic powers asked dorothy yes replied the beaver king he is now as harmless as a child the water of the fountain of oblivion is truly wonderful with ozma's gracious permission i shall take a quantity of it back to my kingdom with me when i return you have the permission now your majesty said a girlish voice all eyes turned to the throne from which the voice came there sat ozma regarding them with a quiet smile i returned only a moment ago ozma said just in time to see the outcome of conjo's ambitious schemes and to grant the request of our good friend the king of the fairy beavers i am sure he will use the water from the fountain of oblivion wisely and well then you know all about our adventures asked the shaggy man yes replied ozama glinda and i finished our tasks on which we had been working steadily and only a few minutes ago we hurried to open glinda's great book of records and brought ourselves up to date on what has happened to you shaggy and your friends as well as the events transpiring here in the emerald city during my absence now that we are together i am happy to greet all my friends old and new ozma concluded smiling at twink and tom the wizard stepped to the side of conjo who was still seated on the throne room floor prattling to the beavers he reached down and unfastened from conjo's wrist ozma's magic compass 
The girl ruler received the magic instrument gravely, her eyes upon Conjo. I wonder, she said, what we should do with him. He is quite harmless now, but we don't want him to learn his old bad ways again. Here Twiffle stepped forward. Your Highness, the little clown began, if I may make a suggestion, I have known Conjo longer than anyone else here. He is not really a bad man. His threats are worse than his deeds. Most of the time he is quite jovial and pleasant. He loves his magic and his wizardry and wants to show it off. Now that he has a chance to begin all over again, if he learned everything again except vanity and if he had the right guide, I believe it is possible that he might become a good wizard. And you want to be that guide, said Ozma, smiling kindly at Twiffle. What do you think, wizard? I believe Twiffle is right, said the wizard. Conjo needs someone to help him now, and Twiffle seems the person to do it. I am very fond of my old home on the island, and I would like to help Conjo, said Twiffle simply. For my part, Twiffle is a brick, put in the shaggy man heartily. Then it is decided, replied Ozma. I will use the magic belt to send Conjo and Twiffle back to the Isle of Conjo. There, Twiffle will help Conjo to become a thoroughly good wizard. Here, Twiffle, Ozma removed a small golden ring from her finger and handed it to Twiffle. Keep this ring with you always. Should Conjo ever ca again cause any mischief, or should you need any help, just rub this ring and you will be transported immediately to wherever I may be. Thank you, your majesty, said Twiffle, looking at Ozma gratefully. Twiffle then bade a fond farewell to Twink and Tom, the shaggy man, the king of the fairy beavers, and all his other new friends. When he had finished, Ozma placed her hands on the magic belt and murmured a command. Twink and Tom looked about the throne room. Conjo and Twiffle were nowhere to be seen. The children knew they would miss the little toy clown but perhaps he would come to their home sometimes to visit his third cousin, Two Waffle. End of chapter 23